Welcome again. We are going to go ahead and get started um, with our webinar on promoting normalcy for children and youth in foster care. We are so glad to have you all with us. Uh, my name is Melissa Blythe and I'm with the Jordan Institute for Families at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Social Work. And um, just one more reminder, if you have not yet had a chance to get the handouts, you can click on that link on the slide um, and we will be referring to those throughout the morning. Uh, thank you again for letting us know um, who's with us. That is great to hear. We have um, over 500 people registered, and um, that includes folks from uh, 59 of our county DSS agencies, um, many of our private child placing agencies, um, as well as about 150 people from our GAL programs across the state. So um, we are thrilled to have such a great cross-section of our state and of our child serving agencies. Um, we know this is a, a topic of great interest to everyone and that many of you as well as our presenters have been a part of making this possible. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, this webinar was developed with funding from the North Carolina Division of Social Services. Um, and um, as you'll hear in a minute, it's done in partnership with a few of our key partners who are with us this morning. Um, the goals for this webinar is, is our hope that by the end of this event, which will be together from 10.30 until 12, that you'll be able to describe the intent behind North Carolina's new reasonable and prudent parent standard, um, and that you'll be able to explain what the standard does and what it doesn't require of your agency. So we think that'll be a helpful and important thing for us to talk about with all of you. We hope that you um, can be thinking about things that you can do to support implementation of these changes in your agency. Um, and we have some great resources to help you do that. And finally, we really um, hope that you will use the information and the resources from this webinar to talk with your resource parents, your foster and adoptive and kinship parents, um, about this topic. Um, we really wanted, I think, the state, I know the state is doing lots of different efforts to educate and inform our county and private agencies and other partners about lots of recent legislative changes, including this one on the Reasonable and Prudent Parent Standard. Um, and so I, I know that our partners at the Division of Social Services really wanted to make sure that um, they're doing what they can to give you all the information you need to also then share it with families. Um, and two of the resources that will be additional resources I just want to mention is um, one is in our publication Fostering Perspectives, which hopefully you're familiar with, which is specifically for foster and adoptive parents. There's a wonderful article um, about this reasonable and prudent parent standard by um, Teresa Strom from the Division of Social Services. And we, um, I think Danielle's going to speak to that. And we also have a link and a copy of that article in your handouts. Um, there will also be another webinar um, that will be coming up on January 22nd. And that will cover a lot of some of the other legislative changes that have been coming up. Today, we're focusing on the reasonable and prudent parent standard. But again, we know there have been lots of recent legislative changes. And so in that event on January 22nd, we'll be hearing um, from one of our same guests, as well as a judge from New Hanover County, um, about um, some of the other changes. So just wanted to set that context. Um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you a very quick orientation and introduce our presenters. Um, then we're going to talk about why there is this focus on normalcy and what that's about and where that, where that, how that came about. Um, we're going to talk about what policy says and what law says about this new standard. We're going to talk about the implementation work group that was um, that worked in North Carolina to help with the rollout of this law, and we're going to talk about what all this means for you and for your agency. We hope to leave plenty of time for Q and A with our presenters. Um, we do have someone online with us. My coworker John McMahon is tr is capturing any questions that you come up with or um, concerns, and we will do our very best to get to all of those today while we're on together. If there are questions or issues that come up that we are not able to answer or that we don't have time to get to, we will be doing a follow-up Q&A document, which if you've 
participate in our webinars before, you know we typically do that. And so don't worry if there's a question that you have. If we can't get to it or don't yet know the answer, we will work with our presenters to try to get that out to everyone who registered and to all of your agencies um, as quickly as possible. So you've already found the chat box pod, which is great. This is your main way to communicate with us today. Um, so thank you so much for doing that. Uh, we hope you will send your questions, your comments, your examples, your thoughts. We know that makes it so much more interesting and more helpful if we get to hear from you and you get to hear from each other. Um, and I'll also mention again, we do have um, folks on with us um, providing technical support. So if you have a technical problem, you can use that chat and you will probably get a private chat back um, from one of those folks and I'm going to introduce them in just a second. So let me introduce our panelists. So we are very excited to have um, these four folks whose lovely smiling faces you can see on your screen. Um, Danielle McConaughey is the NC Links coordinator for the North Carolina Division of Social Services. Uh, let's see, I'm going to do this in order of their pictures. Matt Anderson is the Senior Director of Business Development and Advocacy for the Children's Home Society of North Carolina. Uh, Angie Stevenson is an Assistant Attorney General representing the Child Welfare Section of the North Carolina Division of Social Services. And Shani Stokes is a foster care alumna from North Carolina and also is a family partner coordinator with the Center for Child and Family Health in Durham. So thank you all for being here. We're really thrilled and appreciate all the work you've done to pull this information together for this audience. And so let me turn the mic over to Shani to get us started on why we're focusing on normalcy for kids in foster care. All right, thank you so much, Millicent. So why focus on normalcy? And I think this is um, a topic that will speak volumes to a lot of young people in the foster care system. Um, this topic means a lot to me because of my personal experience with the foster care system as well as the young people I'm connected to who have some, uh, some of the same experiences. Um, I had the privilege of witnessing the signing of the Foster Care Family Act into law, and anyone present in the room could tell how overwhelmed with joy I was because um, this was a huge step in the right direction for a lot of the, uh, the young people currently in the system. Um, it shows that the steps uh, workers and providers are willing to take in order to create a safe and positive and somewhat normal life for youth in care. And it also shows that um, for those young people who decided to speak up and advocate on behalf of this particular issue, that their voice can make change. Um, so and, and that's kind of what, we're going to what I'm going to focus on in terms of um, the normalcy in t uh, around the foster care system and how meaningful it is for young people. Um, so this new law allowing young people in the foster care system to participate in normal activities will create opportunities for youth to experience typical development, which takes place during those adolescent years. So things like going to a friend's house, taking a school trip, working an after-school job, joining a club, uh, dating, attending the prom, and learning how to drive can create a place where youth can increase their ability to think abstractly and make healthy decisions. So not only are normal activities important for development, but these experiences can also create a positive outcome in school performances. A few years ago, I did a focus group with youth in foster care, and our conversation was around positive youth development. And we asked those young people what would help them do well in school, and the young people responded by saying, participating in a, a sport would help me succeed. Uh, one young man gave an example of how he tried he, he tried his hardest not to get in trouble in school because he knew a consequence would be that he wouldn't be able to play his, uh, one of his basketball games. So that idea of him not playing encouraged him to actually um, put effort into um, doing well in his school academics. So activities that allow for healthy, positive relationships uh, is not only important for the current moment, but also for the future as youth grow into adulthood. So throughout my time in foster care, there were moments where I was unable to participate in an activity because of reasons that were out of my control. But in my junior year, I was fortunate enough to be given permission to join the Color Guard team, which was an amazing experience for me. And until this day, I still have um, a few of those young ladies that are friends with, um, I'm friends with now currently. Um, and those relationships really help build who I am and shape my identity. 
Um, and with that, I do want to mention how important identity formation is for the growth of youth in particular. Um, there's a young lady who I work with and is a personal friend of mine who I've watched. She went through high school and then went on to college and graduated. Um, and while in high school, she was given opportunities to be a leader and communicate with all types of people. Um, her social worker was one of her biggest advocates in terms of providing her with opportunities to participate in normal activities. And I do believe that, that, that because of those experiences, it helped shape the person she is today. Um, she's very strong-minded, she's talented, created, and she's confident. And she, as an individual, know who she is. And some, that's sometimes harder for young people in the foster care um, to figure that out because of some of the things that they have to be um, they're exposed to. So despite everything that is going on with the, with the child in care, being provided with an opportunity to feel some sense of normalcy can bring out the resiliency in each individual. Um, I have been a part of an organization known as Say So Strong Able You Speaking Out, and I'm, I, you know, in terms of age, I'm far removed from it, far removed from it, but I'm still connected um, in many ways um, with those young people. And, and over the years, I've witnessed these young um, men and women go on to college and just do some great things because they were given an opportunity just just to feel like they were normal in, in some type of capacity. Um, so I do I believe that this um, this law and the advocates that have put forth the effort to make sure um, there's a small change in the foster care system is going to is going to mean a greatness for a lot of young people in care currently. Thank you so much, Shani, and I think that is really the core of of this. Um, of this law and of all of these changes. And so thank you for really setting that context because that's, that's what we want to come back to is what kids need, what we want for all children, including children in foster care. So thank you so much, Shaney, and for all you did to make this happen in our state. So it looks like um, uh, I see more folks typing on. So glad to have you and so glad um, you enjoyed hearing from Shaney. And let me turn the mic to Angie to talk a little bit more about the details of the law. Good morning. It's um, so great to be part of this webinar. Um, I feel like um, the recent laws are, there's, there's just so much excitement around the recent laws because they've had so much input not only from uh, data about outcomes for youth and former foster youth, but also actual input from youth and foster youth. And I think that that's what makes the recent federal laws and then the subsequent state laws so exciting. I know probably for many of you um, it can be a little overwhelming because there was a lot of new legislation this year. And um, so what uh, we're going to be talking about today, um, I, you know, we would just want to emphasize how important it is and how um, exciting it is at this time because um, I think it helps when you're out in the field to kind of understand where it came from. Um, and I, what I also want to say is that although I'm a child welfare attorney now, I was a foster care social worker in my first career. I'm a second career attorney. And so it's really especially exciting coming from that perspective. OK, so we, I want to back up a little before we talk about the state law and talk a little bit about what was behind it. And um, you know, I mean, we talked about the reason for it. Shani did an excellent job of doing that. But I want to talk about what prompted states to adopt normalcy laws into their state laws. And there was an important federal law that was passed about a year ago. Um, you'll hear it sometimes called House Resolution 4980 or Public Law 113-183. They're talking about the same law. Um, and it required states, in order to continue to get 4E funding, to make some changes in their state laws. So um, that is a, that, that, that was, a, you know, that was motivated states fairly quickly, even though states were already thinking, a lot of states, in North Carolina included, were thinking about trying to um, do something about normalcy, the funding also helps um, to help motivate the states. So you know, the federal law was signed into law on September 29th, 2014, and required states to do something 
in this first year, the first legislative session after that. And so um, quick, North Carolina quickly pulled something together. It was really good timing. Um, there were already legislators that were interested in doing that. So um, that the let me also just say before we move on to the state law that this federal law is called the Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening, Family, Strengthening Families Act. And it covers more than just normalcy. There are a lot of things also geared towards sex trafficking. We're not going to be covering those today, but, because, but we do want to mention it because it did authorize the normalcy provisions. I think it's important as you're looking, as you're thinking about normalcy, that you think about it. It's not really about you doing a list of new things or having a whole new set of activities that are going to be required in, only, in order for you to make reasonable efforts. What it is actually requiring is probably, for some of you, a little bit of a cultural shift. And I think one of the things in North Carolina that um, can either be the challenge or the thing that offers, makes North Carolina so rich is that we have 100 different counties and a lot of times we have 100 different ways of doing things. And so for some counties this will be more of a cultural shift than for others because I think some counties were already doing some, finding ways to, to increase normalcy for foster youth already. Um, it's not, it really isn't, it's not a, um, a bunch of new activities that you have to do. It's going to be just a different way of thinking about kids instead of being so focused on liability that the foster youth that are in custody in your county are unable to do the things that they want to do. You're going to be thinking about it more holistically. So just try to get into that frame of mind as we move forward. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened at the state level here. In, on July 2nd, the Foster Care Family Act was signed into law, and most of the provisions were effective October 1 of 2015. Uh, it, there, there's been a lot of work, there was a lot of work that went into putting that together. Um, again, it was based on the federal law, but North Carolina definitely added its own flavor and its own language and tried to make it fit our state as well as it could. It's really been exciting. Um, I've had an opportunity to participate in several training opportunities about the provisions in this act. And um, I just wanted to also let you know at the DSS attorney conference over the summer, we had foster youth and former foster youth come and talk about normalcy. Senator Beringer, who was the key sponsor of the bill, she um, participated and talked about normalcy. She participated through Skype, which was kind of fun too. So it was really, um, there's really been a lot of work going into the language that's in the law and then about educating people about not just what that language means, but how it applies in real life in the counties. Here's a great picture, and you can see Shaney there in the pink sweater right in the middle. Um, this was the actual signing, and, and what I think is really remarkable is that this doesn't happen every time that a law is passed, but here we had a ceremony and um, the governor was actually at the ceremony. You see Senator Beringer standing next to Shaney, um, who sponsored the bill. There are other foster youth in the picture, and it is just a really, it was really an exciting time when this law and another um, similar law were passed. So um, it was treated really specially re as a special law, and um, I think that that just emphasizes how important it was. You can find out more information about this signing ceremony at the SESO website, which is at www.sesoinc.org. And now I want to go into a little bit about what it actually says in the law. And one thing, for most of you, you're used to finding statutes that govern foster care issues in Chapter 7B, and you will find some reference to the reasonable and prudent parent standard in Chapter 7B, but the, the standard itself is actually found in the licensing statute, which is at 131D-10.2A. So um, that's one 
that's something to make a note of if you're wanting to refer back to that statute. And again, although it affects the proceedings in Chapter 7b, it it's really greatly affects licensing rules and license the requirements for licensed foster parents. Because now foster parents and also um, official, it, in a group care setting, an official has to be appointed to make decisions. They're, they're now authorized to provide or withhold permission for normal childhood activities as long as they're using the reasonable prudent parent standard. And those activities include, it's not, they're not all listed in there. It can go beyond this, but it includes, at a minimum, extracurricular activities, cultural and enrichment activities, and social activities for periods up to 72 hours. The language of the standard is that it's character, these are decisions characterized by careful and sensible parental decisions that are reasonably intended to maintain the health, safety, and best interests of the child while at the same time encouraging the emotional and developmental growth of the child that a caregiver shall use when determining whether to allow a child in foster care under the responsibility of the state to participate in extracurricular enrichment, cultural, and social activities. So you see that it really is an effort to capture what it goes into good parental decisions and requires that kind of decision-making process for, for caregivers, foster, either foster parents or in group care, it'll be an official that's designated at each group care setting. Um, so I think, I think instead of having a list of do's and don'ts, it's really looking at the process that people make to make those decisions. So when, um, when, the, when the caregiver is using this standard, then they have the authority to provide or withhold permission without prior approval of the court or county DSS. Now, of course, um, that is going to not be an absolute. There are always going to be situations. The, the idea here is that you want to be able to individualize um, individualize these decisions and the activities that a, ch that a youth does based on that youth's needs. And in a lot of cases, the person that that youth lives with is going to be in the best position to make those decisions. But there'll be exceptions to that. Um, in fact, there, there's a provision right in the statute that says that it will it'll apply, it'll be the default unless the court orders otherwise. So anytime it's not in the juvenile's best interest or the youth's best interest to have the person that the youth is living with make those decisions, then the court can order otherwise. And I think sometimes that will be um, a question that not everybody in the courtroom will agree on, but the judge will get to make that decision about who will be, who, who if it's not the foster parent or the person in the group care setting making the decisions, who will be doing that. It gives a lot of flexibility, but then sets the person that the youth is living with as the default person. Um, so it applies to family foster care and therapeutic foster care parents. And then, as I said before, if the child is in a group care setting, then there'll be an official designated to make those decisions in that setting. I want to um, also just tell you that you've got some great materials in your handouts, and hopefully you've had a chance to click on those and look at them. But if you haven't, um, they'll be available, and you'll have instructions about how to get to them. You have, lang you have the actual language of the state law. It's in your handouts, which is good because, as we all know, it takes a little while for the websites to get updated with the new legislation, so you'll have it right there. There are some um, materials from, that are in policy now about how to apply the reasonable and prudent standard, and I think Danielle is going to be talking about those a little bit later on. Um, you've got also um, the fostering perspectives that we mentioned earlier, that Millicent mentioned, and then a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. So make sure that um, you take a look at that and that you keep it somewhere as a resource when you can, where you can get to it. 
And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about liability because this is a piece of it. Um, as, as most of you know, often liability is what gets in the way of youth doing normal activities. Um, the bill says that if the caregiver uses the reasonable, prudent parent standard, then they won't be liable for acts for decisions that are made using that standard. So if there were ever to be a lawsuit, I think the issue would be, did they use the standard? Um, so it is, care, it is important that, that you keep the language of that standard in front of you as you're making decisions. Um, they can still be liable if they're, if they're negligent or they don't follow the reasonable, prudent parent standard. And then the other thing that it does for liability is it creates um, a new type of liability insurance that foster parents can purchase. Um, this was a gap before, and there, in some cases, foster parents, potential foster parents with assets were reluctant to become foster parents because um, there was no, uh, they didn't have any ability to purchase insurance for that, and now they, now they will be able to do that. So it's an exciting time. Um, and I'll turn it over now to Millicent. Yes, thanks, Angie. I just was um, conferring with Danielle. So lots of questions, lots of great questions. I'm thinking maybe we'll we'll take a few. Um, we probably won't get to all. We will try to come back to some of them at the end. Um, so one question is, and again, some of these we may not know the answer to yet, but I just want to field one question is, um, when spending the night with friends, who is responsible um, what, I'm sorry, when a child is staying overnight with an individual or family, how is funding provided? Is that something that we know yet about how place, funding for that placement would be affected, Danielle? Yeah, so, good. sorry, can you turn on your mic, Danielle? Hi, this is Danielle. I think I need a little bit more clarification regarding that question. Are we talking about funding the actual foster placement or just funding for the event of spending the night at someone's house? Okay, good good question, good clarification. So while, um, uh, so it looks like, so I see two, um, for the placement, so for example, I guess Medicaid, say, I guess if you're thinking about a therapeutic foster care with the, you know, the the Medicaid. In general, these activities that we're referring to would not necessarily disrupt the placement, so therefore funding would not be an issue. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, what if caregiver permission affects visitation with parents? That is something to consider, and we do in some future slides, we will have an example that okay. a process by which someone would have to consider visitation okay, great. So, before giving permission for an activity. Great. Thank you, Danielle. So yeah, some of them, I'm just trying to look at the questions and hold some of them. I think when Danielle speaks a little bit more about the policy and um, uh, Matt also gives some background, I think some of these will be clear. So I'm just trying to pull out some of the more legal ones. Um, Angie, here's one. Does this law cover kids who are not in DSS custody, i.e. placed with a parent? Yes, it actually does. Um, if you'll look at... Um, 7B903.1, it talks about placement providers as opposed to just foster parents. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, the on the foster parent um, insurance, do foster parents have to apply for insurance, for foster parent insurance? Oh, absolutely not. The, the, and in fact, you know, I mean, this is just to give another option. It's not a requirement at all that they have insurance. Okay, great. So I think I'm going to, I know we still are tracking all of your questions. Do not worry. Um, we see lots of them on billing and also on some complicating factors. So I'm going to hold some of those as we go further. And I think some of that might be clarified as we go along. But thank you all so much. And um, don't worry, keep the questions coming. And like I said, if we are not, if we either don't have time or don't yet have answers, we will be sure to include them in the follow-up document. But with that, Matt, let me pass it to you to talk a little bit about the work group that helped to implement this law in North Carolina. Okay, thank you, Millicent. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on this webinar this morning with folks from across the state. And I do 
have to say it's this is an exciting time I think for North Carolina and particularly for our children in foster care in North Carolina I've had um, lots of experience over the, over the years of working with young people both in foster care and those that have aged out of foster care and I think this idea of finding ways to promote normal childhood experiences is one of the most consistent things that I've heard personally from um, young people about how can we make uh, foster care better both while in care but also preparing um, young people for their transition out of foster care. So I think this will create some new opportunities for us here in North Carolina. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the implementation work group that was put together around this particular provision. So I'll describe a little bit about the work group, the process, and then the end product um, or products that we work towards. So um, as noted um, earlier in this uh, webinar, the standard um, was a requirement in federal policy. It was passed um, in September of last year of 2014 and then enacted through Senate Bill 423 in North Carolina in July. So um, I think as, as most of us probably know and understand that passing a bill is not quite the same thing as implementing a new standard or a new policy. And implementing policy certainly takes time, um, and it really requires that multiple stakeholders um, both appreciate and understand the policy, but also the intent of the policy. Um, and so implementing the intent of this particular policy, um, which is to promote a more normal childhood experience for kids in foster care, um, will be uh, particularly important. Um, so the first step in that process here in North Carolina was to put together an implementation work group that could really begin to understand what um, this policy is um, saying and then how to apply that into practice in North Carolina. And the, the goal of the work group was to develop the reasonable and prudent parenting standard to implement as policy across North Carolina child welfare. So that gives a little bit of, of background. Um, the work group uh, membership, um, it was convened and led by the division um, under the leadership of Teresa Strom and Rick Zeckman. And they pulled together a group, um, pretty diverse group, um, folks from the division, um, policy staff, local support staff, um, staff development, licensing, regulatory staff, um, as well as county DSS uh, representation. And uh, I'm sure some of those folks are on here today. And we had people participating from Cumberland and Pitt County, New Hanover, Moore, Guilford, Scotland, Madison, Onslow, Chatham, Rockingham, Mecklenburg, Warren, maybe others that, that I've missed. But we had a, a, a good group um, from county agencies, GAL, administrative staff participated, SASO participated, and then private agencies um, with myself and then Children's Hope Alliance um, participated. Um, so let me uh, move forward here and just talk about the, the timeline of our work and sort of the activity of our work um, as a work group and working towards an October 1st um, start date to implement this new standard. Um, so really what we are trying to do is produce a set of guidelines um, that would help um, at the local level to implement um, the, the intent and, and the actual standard of the reasonable and prudent parenting um, standard. So those guidelines are in your handouts. Um, and there's also a set of kind of questions in your handouts that can um, help with implementation of this. So the, the, first, uh, the first time the, the group came together was in April, um, worked with a, a framework that was developed in Washington State to implement this standard. Um, and we worked with that and then uh, drafted a first draft of guidelines um, specific to North Carolina. And then uh, the, the work group was asked to sort of go back to their agencies and their counties and, and collect feedback and, and talk to folks on the ground. And then we came back together in June um, to work with that feedback and have a, a second draft of guidelines. And then um, members of the group were asked to do more uh, focus groups with um, foster parents, kinship providers, uh, group home staff, county DSS, um, SASO youth, uh, 
you know, a wide variety of, of focus groups were done to get additional feedback on the guidelines that were being put together. And then that group came together a third time at the end of August and uh, worked towards um, finalizing the guidelines. And then um, they were distributed statewide uh, with the policy change um, update from the division on September 15th. And that went out to all, all stakeholders um, across the state. So that gives a, an overview of the, the work group and what it was doing. Um, the, the product itself that was put together is the Reasonable and Prudent Parenting Activities Guide that, again, is in your handouts. Um, it was based uh, primarily on implementation in Washington State, but also um, other states' implementation kind of guidelines were were used and reviewed. Um, also, there is a, a great resource uh, produced by the Juvenile Law Center in Philadelphia that um, put together a comprehensive overview of the federal policy and how to support this standard and other, other standards. And so the guide itself um, identifies activities that caregivers have the authority to give permission to, and then also describes things that would still require um, prior approval from the county or from the court. Um, and again, we, we want to emphasize that the guideline itself is not a comprehensive list, but does provide um, some well thought out um, ideas of how to implement this standard. Uh, the way it's organized is by activity type, um, and then it describes within that activity type what things um, a caregiver can approve without um, prior approval from the county and what things still would require approval. And this is, this is an example of that. So this is the first category in that guide, um, and it is uh, related to family recreation. And so you can see here on the left-hand side of this, um, it shows examples of things that may come up on a regular basis where caregivers can give um, approval for the um, child or youth to um, participate in those kinds of activities. So you can see the, the list of things here that would show up there. Um, on the right-hand side, there is um, what would still need prior approval from the child welfare agency, from the county agency. Um, so typically what we'll see in this guideline is activities that are going to last over 72 hours would still need prior approval. Or, for example, what's described here is things that may have um, safety or serious safety or legal implications. So um, things that might involve weapons um, in terms of target practice, um, that sort of thing. But also things that may have um, legal implications and really what, what's, what's being described here, too, is to, to, I think, direct attention to there are still going to be applicable, applicable laws that need to be followed, um, and, and that's always important to pay attention to. For example, if um, a young person is going fishing, you know, you still need to make sure that that young person has a, a license to fish. Um, so things, things like that come up throughout the, the guideline, and we try to... Um, to think through as many scenarios as possible and provide as much guidance as possible, understanding that there'll need to be um, decision making that happens um, on a case by case basis and um, just thinking through the intent of this standard. Um, so again, there, there are some resources that you can access in the handouts. There's links here that I believe are the archived links um, where you can, can get um, the guide itself and um, what is being referred to as the one pager, um, which is in your handouts as well. That is a um, a series of sort of critical thinking questions that would be helpful when thinking through. You know, does the standard apply in this situation? As a caregiver, can I um, approve the young person involved getting involved in this particular activity and just move forward with that, or do I need um, approval, or do I need to maybe think that this isn't a reasonable and prudent thing to do in this situation? So questions like, is this activity reasonable and age appropriate? Are there any foreseeable hazards? 
Um, how does this activity promote social development? Which I think is a very important question. Um, another important question would be, how does this activity normalize the experience of foster care? So those are the kinds of um, questions that, that will show up in that guide that I think will be a useful tool to people. Um, so I think that, that concludes um, kind of an overview of what the work group did and, and what we ultimately produced. And those um, resources are um, now available to people moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. I see lots more great questions. Um, and so I want to just turn it over to Danielle, because I think some of what you say will really help to clarify, and in particular the idea about this being sort of a standard rather than a checklist of you can, it can't, all children may do this, all children may not do this, but how do you make that decision, help your foster parents make that decision and document that? So um, let me pass the mic to... Uh, Thank you, Millicent. Um, again, good morning, folks. Um, this is Danielle. Um, I echo the sentiments that have already been expressed in the room regarding that this is an exciting time for children and youth in foster care with this legislation as well as other um, aspects of the um, act that was signed into law and legislation that will be presented in January. So um, as the state links coordinator, I'm super excited about this. And so hopefully you all, I based on the questions that we've been viewing, um, I sense there's a lot of anxiety regarding this. So hopefully as we move forward, we can allay some of that and just acknowledge that this is something that we will work through together as a state, um, as a collaborative group to um, meet the needs of our young people in care. So what does this mean for our county child welfare agencies? Um, this um, legislation presents an opportunity um, that acknowledges that um, there is power in partnership. Um, historically, child welfare has been primarily responsible for making decisions as it relates to the safety and welfare of children in custody. Um, this standard now shifts the onus of the decision making as it relates to the child's involvement in normal activities to share in these decisions with foster caregivers. We are not alone. While the intent of the law is to transfer the majority of the decisions to foster caregivers, um, the child welfare social workers will still need to be involved to provide guidance and support to these caregivers. Um, this is an opportunity, as the law says, we need to train and empower our caregivers. Um, county licensing and approval staff should provide information about the reasonable and prudent parent standard, um, as well as information about the foster child's participation in extracurricular enrichment and social activities as part of any of their orientation and training for caregivers. Um, whether it's for new caregivers, we also need to acknowledge that we have some seasoned providers out there and we need to be training them as well. Um, the one pager that Matt and Angie both alluded to in applying the reasonable prudent parent standard will be um, helpful in orienting your new caregivers to the standard and helping them to decide on when it's appropriate to allow a young person um, to participate in any activity. In order for this standard to be successfully implemented, we all need to have com good communication and collaboration um, between the caregivers, the child welfare agency, as well as the child's family. Um, the child welfare agency staff should facilitate shared parent parenting meetings between the caregivers and the families that specifically address these normal activities. That um, This is an opportunity for us to get to know more about what the child needs, more about what the family desires, and it empowers the foster parents to make better decisions when it comes to allowing them to participate in these activities. We also want to utilize our child and family team meetings in the same way. So it will be essential that the child welfare agency encourages participation of all parties in these, pro and as well as um, facilitating these meetings for these discussions to occur. Likewise, the private child placing agencies will need to review their current policies to ensure that they're consistent with the law. Um, they will also, um, 
if it's a group or child care um, institution, as Angie indicated earlier, that they will need to identify an on-site official to be able to exercise the standard. Um, and the private agencies will also be responsible for training and empowering their foster parents. Um, in, at any level in terms of new orientations or just their ongoing training. And again, they too can use the one pager that's available. Um, communication, like I indicated earlier, is key to the success of this, um, the implementation of this standard. So what does this mean? It's really a lot of this uh, onus is now shifted to the foster parents. So everyday parents are making decisions about ch their child's activities. Foster parents are faced with the same decision making for children in their care. However, they also have to consider um, the child's interests in terms of their health and safety as well as the laws and regulations um, from the agencies with which they're licensed from. So think about that for foster parents and that this is a lot for them. Some of this will be new. Some of this that they've been doing, like Angie indicated, this foster parents has been, been around. They've been making these decisions. Didn't even know that there was an issue to make the decision. <laughs> um, and then there's some who, out of being new, they are more reluctant and these decisions have always been made by the Child Welfare Agency. So now that they are empowered to approve or disapprove, and in many cases, a child's foster care, uh, the child's participation in any of the activities, they're using their own assessment skills um, to apply this standard um, without the approval from the Child Welfare Agency or their licensing agency or even the court in a lot of matters. So this is giving them the permission to parent. This is exciting for a lot of young people and foster caregivers because there is a burden and most foster parents, they want to do it right. They want to do it correctly and so it, we need to allow them to have, to give them this permission but we also need to be there to support them in this process of decision making. Um, now, in some respects, there's been a practice within child welfare that creates a culture of care that disempowers foster parents from being parents and often results in them not allowing children in their care to participate in activities just out of fear of licensing punishments. It can also force foster parents to call the child's caseworker about every decision they make, including things like allowing the child to attend a birthday party or play sports. This overburdens workers. That's a lot of phone calls. Um, it makes foster youth even feel even more isolated from their peers because they have to have several channels to get permission just to do any activity. And this can result in them feeling less, this gives them a less fulfilling childhood. So essentially, they, foster parents now have guidance, clear guidance, to not say no just to manage risk. And we should recognize that as the professionals that this is a normal process. Just if you are a parent or a caregiver in some respect, you're making decisions out there and you're getting information to help you make those decisions, but you're not just saying no for the sake of saying no to keep everyone house bound and sitting on a sofa watching TV <laughs> just because it's easier to do. In addition, the law pr um, provides protection from liabil liability when applying the standard. And so we, we need to um, we need to respect that and look at the process by which decisions are being made by the um, foster caregivers when they are applying this standard. So I guess the next couple of slides will help you as professionals who are working with the caregivers um, in terms of training or as you are moving forth to educate them about the new standard. Um, now that they have the responsibility of making decisions related to the normal activities of, of children and youth in care, we need to help them feel confident in taking on this responsibility. And as a collective group, we can um, encourage caregivers to take advantage of training being offered as it specifically relates to the emotional, developmental, and physical needs of the children in their care. Um, there's lots of training through staff development. One for older youth is um, for foster parents helping youths reach self-sufficiency. That's offered through um, independent living resources that can be, um, folks can sign up through NCSW Learn. 
Um, we can direct caregivers to communicate with their licensing agency and the county child welfare agencies and look at the policies and practices w between those agencies and to help them understand um, how to apply the standard. We also want to make sure we are um, engaging the child's family in everything that we do when it's possible. Um, they are important and just because the standards allows for um, foster parents to make decision, the better communication between the child's family and the foster caregivers, um, they will be more successful and will be honoring and respecting the family's wishes throughout that process. We want to encourage the foster caregivers to utilize natural points of contact such as home visits, visits and treatment team meetings, um, as opportunities to communicate regularly with agency staff and the child's family. Um, we also want to invite them to participate in the shared parenting, child and family team meetings and court hearings to increase their knowledge and awareness of the needs of the young people in their care. So our responsibility is to encourage foster caregivers to assert their authority as the child's nurturer and advocate for and encourage participation in normal activities based on their knowledge about and experience with the child. So here is a slide that we can use to help foster parents when we're giving or foster caregivers information about applying the standard. Um, and applying the standard, um, they're required to take reasonable steps to determine the appropriateness of the activity um, in consideration based on the child's age, maturity, develop, and developmental level. It's recognized that there are many different approaches to determine whether an activity is appropriate for a child in care. Although not all inclusive, here are some steps that a caregiver can um, make or take to determine, to make that determination. First, they need to have adequate information about that young per person in order to make informed decisions. And so therefore, we need to ensure that we are providing information to them about the child's history, the case plan, given the inf they need to have information about the court orders that are in place. If they're not aware of the child's history or their plan, then they need to be consulting the social worker. And we need to... Um, sharing that responsibility and making sure that they have as much information that is needed to for them to make good decisions. Um, they can consider where the activity will be held, who the child will be with, and when the child will return. These aren't real enlightening um, considerations. These are things that people do day in and day out, but we want to encourage our foster parents to have this line, train of thought, the where, who, when, and to be able to answer those questions when they're making those decisions. Um, is it age appropriate? Um, should a three-year-old be going to a birthday party by themselves? That probably wouldn't be the best idea. Can they go to a birthday party perhaps with the um, foster parent there? <laughs> so these are things you want to make sure that it's age appropriate. Um, will we let 11-year-olds go out dating? Well, we need to look at <laughs> the 11-year-old and really what's the standard and what does dating mean? <laughs> so there are things to um, consider. Um, also, we want to make sure that they're taking into account the child's mental and physical health and their behavioral capacities. We have a, y a lot of young people in care who have a lot of trauma histories and they have mental health issues, some um, have some physical issues and we need to ensure that all of those um, aspects of the child are being considered when these decisions are being made. So, and also we just, um, foster parents and foster caregivers will need to think about what's the risk here in terms of safety factors and what supervision um, is needed to uh, ensure that there's no harm to the child. For instance, I saw a question that came up about hunting. Well, that's probably an activity that you're going to, if someone's allowed to participate, we're going to think about what supervision is being provided, provided, who's trained in that, or who's had experience in that um, before you let the young person go off hunting. <laughs> if they. In addition, we want to make sure that we are using the one pager called applying the reasonable, prudent, the reasonable and prudent parent standard that you have in your handouts. There's a series of questions that you, basic questions that you can use to apply to just about any situation that will help 
um, foster caregivers, and that's um, within your handouts. Let's go through a case example. Um, thanks to Teresa Strom from the Division of Social Services. Um, here's an example. In addition, before I go along, I just want to highlight that the Foster and Perspectives, um, an excerpt of that is attached to your handouts. That also includes a few other illustrations that Teresa um, highlighted in the article regarding applying the reasonable and prudent parent standard. So here we have a 15-year-old girl in care who asks permission to try out for soccer. She goes to her caregiver to ask for permission. Um, if she makes the team, she must attend practice every day after school for three to four months. During the season, she'll have games one, one or two evenings per week, some at home, some at other schools in the county. Her grades are mostly B's and C's. She visits with her birth family once a week and has counseling appointments every other week. Um, you don't enjoy athletics as her foster caregiver. And your birth children did not play team sports in high school, so you're not familiar with what's all involved. So here are things that you may consider as the caregiver when you're trying to apply the standard. You might want to talk to the um, child's family as well as the social worker about whether they support this young person playing soccer at all. Um, consider, and if they do, you may have to um, And if they do, um, you may um, want to consider, is it, does it conflict with any visitation? Again, I saw a question about, um, in the chat at some point about what if this conflicts with parent-child visitation. Again, we want to ensure that our young people have access to activities, but we also want to make sure that their parent and child visitation is not disrupted as a result of them. Um, the, as a caregiver, you may need to talk to the soccer coach to discuss the length of practice. Um, you got to consider how long it takes for your foster daughter to complete homework and study in order to maintain her grades. Um, does she have enough time to do that in addition to practice? Um, you may have to find out if um, you can move the counseling appointment to Saturday if it's during the week. Um, you want to talk to the friends and family or coaches um, for names of other families who are involved with the sport, since you're not familiar with it. Um, and then you want to talk to the coach, the social worker, and the family about costs to the, um, the, the sport, as well as transportation. There are many things to consider. These are just a few items in terms of when someone is applying the standard. Everything doesn't necessarily result in an immediate yes or an immediate no, but we have to consider all the variables associated with this individual being able to engage in this activity. So in terms of the guardian at litem, guardians at litem, they play a critical role in helping to promote normalcy for children in care. First of all, you would need to know the standard. Um, in understanding, assisting, you would need to know the standard in order to assist the caregivers in their decision making by offering advice and support based on their knowledge of the case while not making this decision for the caregivers. Um, you may notify, the GAL may notify the Child Welfare Agency if there's a an issue or a conflict with policy or practice that's inconsistent with the with applying the reasonable and prudent parent standard, and if it presents a barrier to the child being able to achieve normalcy. Um, the GAL can help in advocating for solutions to overcome those barriers um, as they relate to, say, cost, logistics, how are we going to do this, how are they going to get there, um, in addition to the policies like I indicated. And always remember that being reasonable means that reasonable people can disagree and that our job is to make sure that we are working through for the best interests of the young people to, in order for them to have as much normalcy as possible. So ultimately, who benefits from this legislation are the young people in foster care. So we've heard um, Shaney's in, um, reported about um, why it's important for normalcy. We've heard um, from 
Angie <laughs> about <laughs> the participation of young people in um, being able to be involved in the development of this law in North Carolina and the signing of it. So we've heard the voice of youth from North, Car North Carolina and across the country. And the legislation is reflective of that collective voice. We've listened. Now it's time for us to act. In, in June, um, of 2015, the White House held a briefing on normalcy and invited youth involved with the Jim Casey Youth Opportunities Initiative, as well as child welfare leaders across the country, to hear br information about the benefits of normalcy and why it's, it's important. I had the privilege of attending this event. There was a former foster youth from Texas who presented his story and the barriers he had to overcome to achieve normalcy in foster care similar to some of the things that Shaney was mentioning. He discussed how he was actively involved in school activities, including sports. He was on the honor roll prior to entering foster care. When he entered foster care, he said everything stopped. Um, he went from an A student to failing to the point he even ran away. He said that he described foster care as being more traumatic than the, the, than the neglect he experienced living with his mentally ill mother. Ultimately, when he ran away, he, he maintained com, um, contact with the social worker. And he told his social worker he would come back into care if these conditions were met. Essentially, if every activity he was engaged in, was, he was able to um, participate uh, again, um, as well as if he w was able to maintain in the community in which he left. So I think he was placed out of his community as well as wasn't allowed to participate in any of those activities. He indicated that I think it was just the foster parent not knowing him and not understanding the needs that he had, nor was it the agency's um, understanding of his needs in terms of participating in those activities. So he did eventually return to care um, because those conditions were met. In the audience, you could hear everyone groaning. You could see grimaces on the child welfare leaders' faces because no one could believe that such a thing could occur when a young person who was at the top of their game was placed in foster care and that these things could actually occur. And he just indicated and told us, let us not forget that these same young people that we are placing in care have the same hopes, dreams, and desires as their peers and deserve the same opportunities to achieve those hopes, dreams, and desires. And he stated and left us with this, foster care is a legal status. It's not a person in personality trait. So in addition, let's look at we are empowering our young people to um, advocate for themselves. We are empowering them through normalcy in terms of they their voices are being heard. So the transition plans are the process by which we can get their voice out in their individual cases. Um, we're mandated by law to have transition plans for youth ages 14 and older. But even with the case plans, we need to be sure that we're addressing the normal activities that these young people are participating in. Um, the, transition, the transition plans allow for the older youth to be active drivers of the development of their plans, but the professionals and the advocates around can ensure that the case plans incorporate normal activities for um, all children in care. Ultimately, this new standard will result in normalcy for children and youth in care. Um, when young people in care afford the opportunity, opportunities to engage in activities that promote their healthy de development, they have a better chance of overcoming those negative outcomes that are frequently associated with those who transition out of the foster care system, such as homelessness, substance abuse, early parenting, criminal activities, etc. So remember that we as professionals are not here forever for these young people. Participation in these activities helps prepare them to live independently as they transition to adulthood. All right, thank you, Danielle. Thanks so much. That was great. And um, lots of questions. So I want to also say um, this, this webinar is being recorded. And so I'm sorry, I should have said that at the very beginning, but it is being recorded along with all of our other webinars. Um, they will be available. Um, 
through NCSW Learn as well as on the FCRP website. If you registered for this event through any means, you will receive a follow-up email to let you know when that recording is available. And we will also have posted there the handouts for this event and the follow-up document, the follow-up Q&A document that we'll be doing with your questions. Um, and you, of course, can feel free to share that not only with your coworkers, but also with your foster parents. Even, you know, if you wanted to bring in your foster parents and have a training using any of this material, um, it is all free for you to use. Um, and I think that's important to say in part because a lot of the questions have been about specific decisions, about haircuts, about hunting, about riding with other teens and cars. And I think um, what I'm hearing from you all is this really is not about a yes or a no across the board on any specific activity. It's about you're going to use this standard in the law to make a decision. Your foster parents, for the most part, are going to try to make these decisions and you're going to support them and you've been given some questions to ask to help you and your foster parent make those decisions so that for one child riding in a car with other teenagers may be an OK thing based on that particular child's developmental level, history, activity, strengths, and needs, whereas for another child, it may not be a safe thing. Um, and so Angie, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about sort of what agencies need to be thinking about in terms of their documentation and support around how these decisions get made. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, and I saw a bunch of questions that were, you know, I would have to ask about 100 questions to answer them. So you're going to be in the best position. And I think sometimes when you have a lot of flexibility, like this law gives you, it can feel a little scary. But that's because you're, you're opening yourself up to a little bit more risk than you typically do. And um, it's going to be calculated risk, though, and you want to make thoughtful decisions that do allow for a little bit more risk than maybe the across-the-board decisions that just absolutely said no would would do. Um, I think one one place to start is just looking at that one pager, the applying the reasonable and prudent parent standard, and just start asking yourself some of these questions. Um, and ask other people if you don't know the answer. Is this activity reasonable and age appropriate? Are there any foreseeable hazards? So if you're looking at hunting, um, particularly hunting, you know, you might obviously there that there are foreseeable ha hazards with hunting. That doesn't mean it's a absolute no, but that means that you're going to have to think about how you mitigate for those hazards. Um, how does the activity promote social development? How does this activity normalize the experience in foster care? And on down the list, you want to just go through those questions. I think you're going to have a pretty good, you're going to have enough, if you answer those questions, you're going to have enough information that in most cases you're going to be able to answer the question that you have. Um, and if you're documenting the answers to those questions, then I think you've really um, shown, and, and it helped, help, you know, it's not always going to be DSS. Obviously, these decisions are going to be made a lot of times without DSS even being involved in the actual decision making. But when you're talking to foster parents about how they should apply this one pager, I think you can explain it like this. And have them, if it's something controversial, have them document how they made the list. Make sure that they know about the activities that are already covered in the activities guide, um, which, by the way, that does still have a draft watermark on these handouts. Earlier this week, I believe, or maybe the end of last week, the the um, version without the draft watermark was put into policy. So you should be able to find that online, um, and it will not have the draft watermark on it anymore. It's in the um, it's it's an attachment in tw in section 1201 of the policy manual. Um, but use that reasonable and prudent parenting activities guide draft, and make sure that they know know the um, categories that have already been addressed, because that's the place to start. Great. Thank you, Angie. So I want to just cover a few things quickly. One question is, how does this change affect foster parent or kinship providers participating in IOP or 508 meetings? It does not affect that in any way. Is that right? Or would you say anything about that, Angie? Um, you no, know, I, I mean, I think that all along, placement providers were encouraged to participate in IEP and 504 plans, um, and 
so that shouldn't change at all. I, I, it is probably a very normal thing for the person living with the child to participate. Now, I, I don't know if part of this question is whether they can be the person that signs the IEP. That hasn't changed either, and, they, and no, DSS can't be the one who signs, and, and the foster parent can't either. They'll have to um, have a um, surrogate, I think it's called, signed. Sign, so you'll have to have an additional person, but that doesn't mean that the caregiver can't participate, and they should be encouraged to participate. Great. I know there was also a question about whether any change in the state board rate has been discussed. This, that is not a part of this law. I'm looking, shaking heads. I do think there is the issue of, you know, one of the things that will come up with foster parents making more decisions and with normalcy will be costs around participating in sports, participating in extracurricular activities. So I'm looking at my panel if anyone would like to speak to that. Um, you know, we want to promote normalcy. We want children and youth to be able to do these things. Um, other than looking at those community resources, your PTAs, your booster clubs, your schools, to see what funding is available. Anyone have any other comments about that? I think that's a fair question. I, I think the process of exploring those resources can be done in a collaborative fashion. I think the social worker could be working with the foster parent as well as the child's families from which they come from in terms of looking at who can help provide what. Um, that one of the things, and just taking this legislation a little further, we are notifying relatives when children come into care. They all aren't placement resources, but they might be resources to help um, in this situation to assist, you know, the young people in care. And so while they may not be a, a placement or even a full visiting resource, there might be things that they could assist with. So we have to get creative, and we should be using our CFTs and those shared parenting meetings to help, in, you know, come up with those resources. Um, the state, you know, for older youth, we've always had links funds for certain things to help them overcome those barriers. And likewise, these funds will still be available to help with these normal activities in some respects. But whenever young people, whenever counties come to me, I ask what, is, what other resources have they explored? Because we have limited funds. So we want to make sure that um, all the young people in care have access to these activities. So we just have to share the wealth. <laughs> Thank you. Um, also a question about whether these um, the standard applies to kinship placements as well, and if you want to speak to that. Yes, if you look at the first part of your handout, um, at the on page three of the new act, um, 7B903.1, and then subsection B talks about placement provider. It doesn't just cover foster parents, so it, it also it covers any placement provider. Great, thank you, Angie. Just trying to go through. So I think one of the things that has come up, and this certainly came up in our planning for this webinar, is that idea of risk that you spoke to, Angie, and the idea that you know normal development for all of us and for all of our children is in part about taking some risk and about making mistakes and about learning from those mistakes. And that's really a big part of this bill. I think the uh, intent is to give children in care that same opportunity to develop from normal risks and consequences. And so that is a real sh culture change. So I want to also ask about criminal background checks for some of these overnight stays, because we've gotten several questions about are they done, who does them, and, and how that works. So what would you say about that? Well, again, I, um, I don't think that there is necessarily an absolute one way or another on the criminal background checks, but um, I think a lot of people let their own children spend the night at a friend's house without a background check, and so I think that kind of should be your default. Um, but again, you really want, there's flexibility built into this law, so you really want to tailor it to the individual needs of the child. Um, and I can't say that there would absolutely be no situation where you wouldn't want to do some kind of background check. But the default, I think, would be how you, you know, as the foster parent, how, how would you parent your own child and use that reasonable prudent parent standard to guide you. Great, thank you. Do you want to speak to that, Danielle? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Is there something else? Go ahead. Yes, I see that there's a, um, someone that believes that there's a conflict between. So in the presentation, we indicated that the guardian at litem is helping the foster caregiver come to these decisions without making the decisions for them. But there is state legislation about the GAL being able to sign for driver's privileges. And those are two, while driving is a normal activity for older youth, those are two, that's a specific um, normal activity and um, that is and if they are signing for that I believe the courts or somehow will be involved or whatnot but it's a different um, um, thing than the reasonable prudent parent standard so I just want to make sure we're not confusing that and that's why we also didn't address driving privileges here in this that's a separate and I don't have that legislation to for formally and fully look at that to see what it says but I just want to make sure folks know that that's a separate piece of legislation. That legislation actually is in the same act. This is Angie. Um, it's just further on if you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, it's in part four, reduce driving barriers for foster children. Um, this allows foster youth that you know are old enough and, um, and have followed the law in, in getting it and can pay for their own insurance um, or have a way to pay for their own insurance to be able to get a drive a, driver's permit and license. So um, where previously it was really difficult just because of some barriers that were all, that were in the law mm -hmm. and in the insurance laws. But that's a specific to driving privileges. So in general you wouldn't necessarily, the GAL wouldn't be making decisions over the foster parent <laughs> for young people to participate in activities because the, the young people don't live with the GAL. Right, but they. Are I think the yeah. GAL, if there, if it went to hearing, the GAL would have input mm -hmm. in a hearing. But right. generally, no, they wouldn't be applying the reasonable prudent parent. Exactly. So I know there were some other questions on the specifically on the insurance, and I'm going to hold on those because I know Danielle, you've spoken about wanting to get some more guidance on that, particularly for in the follow-up document, because that is sort of a, a complicated issue. Also, there's a question on um, consent. Uh, informed consent for things like psychotropic medications and whether foster parents are now able to make those decisions. So Angie, would you address that? Sure. sure. Um, that is covered in another section, um, actually of a different piece of legislation. Um, and so it would not be governed by the reasonable prudent parent standard. It's going to be governed by the new language that is going into 7B. Of course, I'm going to going to remember, I think it's 7B 505.1. Um, and that will be covered in more detail in the webinar in January. So under this standard does not cover informed consent for medical treatment? That's right. OK. Um, that, so that, that there will be a, another webinar on that on informed consent, as Angie said, because we know also that's an, an, another area that is a little more complex. Um, so just going through our questions quickly, um, I do see, um, we see a lot of questions on payment. Um, we know we had, thank you, Tina from the division saying if, if, if the overnight stay is with a licensed foster home, then respite uh, payment can be made to that home. But I think this bill is really talking more not about a planned respite that the agency arranges or even the foster parent arranges, but more of a social um, overnight that the teen is doing and so those that would not be considered respite. Um, I don't know, Danielle, if there's anything else in terms of the um, no, paying I think, for those types of overnights. No, we're talking about a normal activity just like if your young person came to you, if you're a caregiver and asked to spend a night at their friend's house down the street. <laughs> um, this isn't a respite. Placement isn't changing. They still live in your home. <laughs> They still have a bed, and they're coming back there. Um, and you're not making, you're not going out of town, so you're not making a pl uh, a formal arrangement for somebody for respite. Um, those decisions will be made at this on a case by case basis in terms of respite. But this isn't about placement change. This is about normal activity. And I saw a lot of those questions, even with haircuts. We're not talking about necessarily just personal care things that we would have engaged parents before about their young people, this is about some of the normal things that kids participate in that other kids do and they just can't because they're in foster care or we've decided the risk is just too great. 
And so really it's just a process of helping the, the foster parent apply the standard, the agencies who are working with them, um, encouraging them in their decision making and how to make those decisions as well as engaging the families and facilitating those discussions. And okay. Easier said than done. And Danielle, <laughs> I kind of think about respite as um, creating normalcy for the foster parent. Where the, I think this bill was really about creating normalcy for the youth. That's so um, good. They're both important, but um, that's just not what was covered in this bill. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think you're right, Heather, um, from Easter Seals, I do see you're also talking about whether the, the therapeutic agency would then be paid for that night if the child is not actually in the home. So I think, I think some of those questions we will be sure to have in the follow-up document, and we will clarify with um, the licensing unit and with others at the division, because I, I think that's a, you know, that's a great question, and we want to make sure we're giving you clear guidance. Just going through quickly. Um, so, because um, I know there's lots of questions on payments, and so we will be sure to include those. Um, another interesting question, I, I think it's also obviously going to be case-by-case -case basis, but the issue of um, sexually reactive youth and confidentiality that might come up when you're considering um, activities for them. So anyone want to speak to that? Um, I, this is Angie, and I would just say that I would think a lot of times sexually reactive group or youth might be in a category that where you would the court would order something other than the reasonable prudent parent standard just because not I mean we want to still create normalcy as much as possible for that youth but you need but it it, it can't be something that puts someone else at, at risk so I don't want to you know again I'm really trying hard not to give bright line rules and, and instead talk about individualizing decisions but that might be a, a situation where you're going to want the court to be more involved or um, DSS to be more involved than just um, delegating everything to the foster parent. Also, a lot of great questions on things like um, what, how this might affect person-centered plans for children in higher level placements or out-of-home family service agreements. And I think, as some folks have already said, it clearly will. I mean, you know, that that's one of the tools I think you were talking about, Danielle Wright, about um, collaboration and communication, that having these conversations at your child and family team meetings, at your treatment team meetings, that it's a great way to be proactive in thinking through some of the situations, some of the ways that your team can support normalcy for each child. And can we think of those things ahead of time so that, for example, if a child is going to do a trip, um, that they have the, the letter from your agency, which you certainly can still have someone ask about whether you still want to give kids the letter that shows their guardianship um, for, for travel, absolutely. But the more those things can be planned and discussed ahead of time so they don't lead to us saying no to a kid because we don't have things in place is, is great. So great that people are thinking about how do we be proactive and communicating and maybe making some of these decisions as a group ahead of time. Um, OK, just trying to go through. Um, so really interesting question. What happens if a foster parent um, makes a decision that DSS disagrees with? Just looking at my panel. <laughs> I'm, and it's so hard because that's such a broad <laughs> statement. They can, we can disagree with a lot of things, but the, that's an opportunity for the DSS and the foster parent to work to discuss the issues that um, were of concern at the time. Um, doesn't necessarily mean there's consequences, but those are opportunities to have those conversations. Um, and Angie mentioned about documentation um, from providers um, and to ensure how they're implying the standard. And if it's reasonable, that's where the law protects providers. Um, again, I had indicated that reasonable people can disagree, and it's not necessarily there's going to be poor outcomes as a result of the disagreement, but we can. And so um, think about a two-parent situation um, where, you know, I'm going to use a traditional sense of mom and a dad making decisions, and mom may not agree with dad, you know, decision about that mom may have certain concerns, um, but those are normal things that happen. So in child welfare and foster care, you kind of have the foster parent and the social worker being the two parents per se. <laughs> and so there can be op a lot of opportunities where folks are going to disagree, but that's where you communicate and you come to so the next decision can be better. <laughs> and I think also um, 
at the next hearing, if DSS wants to get clarification there, you can bring it up in court and have input from everybody. I don't know. What do you think, Shani? About you? <laughs> She's nodding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because because I she, you know, I just was wondering how, how it would have. I think you want input from the the youth if they're old enough to communicate mm -hmm. it as well. I also think, and not to exclude the GAL, could be somebody in court also who's advocating for that young person. And there is a disagreement in the room between the foster parents and social worker and the young person. So the GAL could step in as well in terms of advocating. So, Shani, I think you had maybe something else you wanted to comment on, though. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Angie just brought up a really good point around, you know, getting the young person's perspective on the situation is going to be very important, especially if it's age appropriate. Uh, two things I wanted to, to mention, um, just to kind of like ending notes, um, just validating and recognizing that the foster parents, this is maybe something new for them. Um, and I know just me being as a parent, my child plays football, and I'm just grateful that the week is almost over, the season's almost over, because it is a commitment. Um, and so it, it's going to be it's going to be important that the foster parent has people on their team, support systems that can navigate those um, activities to help with transportation or if they have multiple children in their home. So kind of thinking about that um, as a big picture. And then the one thing that I think you know a lot of people know me for is I, I think accountability is, is important when it comes to young people. And while the law is, is is in effect and while it's a great change, it's still a privilege for young people. And so I think, you know, it's been hit on a lot about individualizing this the situation for each spe specific child is important. So if a child is not behaving correctly or they're not getting good grades, you know, things like that, just because it's in law doesn't mean they have to do it. And I think that needs to be articulated to some capacity to the young people as well because we can definitely, from experience, we can take it and run with it and think that everything is supposed to be our way because it's now law and that's not the case. So while we're informing workers and informing foster, uh, foster parents, at some point this information has to be shared with the young people too. Absolutely. Thank you, Shani. Yeah, and, and I think there's been some great chat also about um, involving involving the young people, having those conversations proactively, involving birth parents. There was also a question about, you know, what if birth parent and foster parent disagree? It's another um, wrinkle that might come up. And so really this is going to be about communicating and, and really getting that input from the youth about what's most important to them. Um, do, okay, just looking to say, okay, so looking for last questions um, because I do want to make sure we want to um, honor our time period and um, make sure we give tell you again about how to get credit for this. Um, so um, again, we will be doing a follow-up document. We'll provide, and I, I saw the chat uh, agree that um, we'll try to get some clarification around some of the payment issues. Um, and also on this upcoming webinar, the, the notice for this should probably be going out. I'm not sure. Maybe John can help. But um, uh, in December, I would say, for the upcoming webinar where we will talk more about issues around medical consent um, and some of those other special situations. And we will also be providing follow-up on some of the driving issues because we know that's a big one and paying for insurance. Um, also saw a question about whether um, is there insurance now available, liability insurance for foster parents, and if you have information on that that we could share? What I understand is that the Insurance Commission um, has has in place a waiver that can be added to a foster parent's, I think, homeowner's insurance that wasn't available, or I'm sorry, a rider that can be added to their insurance that wasn't available previously. I don't know much more about the mechanics, but I'm, I imagine the first place to start would be with your home, whoever is providing homeowner's insurance for that foster parent. OK, thank you. Um, so again, we have tracked all your questions, and we will do our very best to provide some additional answers and resources in that follow-up document. I think, Bill Schultz, that's a great point that, as, as Danielle said, this really is about um, shifting some of that burden of decision-making from the agency to the caregiver of the child, and really, what do we need to do to communicate and educate and empower um, those caregivers and the youth in care um, to be able to be more actively involved and be more empowered to do these things that really do promote 
development, the same kind of development we want for all of our children. Um, so thank you all so much um, uh, for the excellent questions and suggestions.